Happy New Year, everyone. How you guys doing? <laughs> okay, it's not my first coffee, obvious, but it's our first Q and A uh, in 2021, and more to come. <clears throat> so, how are you guys feeling today? Um, I'm a little bit cold. I kind of underestimated my our stove and my new insulation in our center. So anyway, we're totally prepared for this. How did you guys go so far? How was your holidays? Um, what was your affirmation for this new year? How are your dogs doing? Did you get rid of your visitors? <laughs> These things happening. <laughs> so where are you guys looking at from? Where, where are you looking from? Good morning, Christina. <laughs> you know what? That's the most important, that's the most important thing. I, I don't know how people can live without I mean, coffee. Obviously, some people live with tea, but I kind of like coffee. They like just like beer, there's always there's always a thing with people. There's always something for people to like. Either coffee or tea or beer, you know, in, in Germany, beer is basically kind of like a nutritional thing. You can have a beer at your job. That's normal. I don't know how it is now. Hi to Texas. <laughs> how are you guys doing? Hi to Oregon. Christina, where are you guys else from? How about you type me your, you don't need to put me a zip code, but just, you know, where you're coming from, state, country, earth, planet, whatever you guys from. Yeah, you guys are from Eugene. Hi there, Springfield. I love, I love, I like Springfield. There's nice places there to go. I like with COVID, it's kind of everything struggling. So I'm a Roman with holistic dog training. If you don't have figured it out yet, we're talking about dogs in generally. We talk about spirituality. We talk about nutrition. I'm not a nutritionist. Don't get me wrong. I I do, however, have a good knowledge about nutrition and as I use it for my practice. Um, I am a certified dog trainer and holistic behaviorist. And I know some people will turn their eyes over it's like, oh, holistic. Yeah, well, holistic. Um, it, it has a lot in there. So when I answer your questions, I'm coming from a holistic perspective, meaning is I try to get to the root of everything. No, I will not ask you for your shoe sizes. However, I will ask how you feel about things when the dog does certain things because all these things are correlated. And um, for you guys who are interested to learn more about your dog, um, next week, uh, next Saturday, <clears throat> I'm going to do a little bit differential. We're going to have, um, we're going to have a little bit more information going on. We will talk about um, forgiveness. Hi, Diane, in UK. You know what? You guys are as cold as I am, and you guys likely as rainy as we are here in Oregon. So a big hello. <laughs> Having, no, what do you guys have there? Do you guys have dinner now or you have yeah i think you guys have dinner so tea time obviously duh <laughs> so yeah so on our next saturday we're going to talk about uh forgiveness and how forgiveness is important a very important factor in behavior modification um no you don't have to go to church for it don't worry about it happy new year to you guys too um but in in a dog world forgiveness towards each other is an important factor of social interaction. So um, I just wanted to give you guys a heads up just in case you have no clue what to do next weekend. <laughs> um, okay, one help me get my Danif to stop throwing his legs paws. Throwing, okay, I swear. <laughs> yeah, you know what? This is the thing with, with Danif. When there are puppies, it's kind of like cute when they come these like little tiny cute paws. Okay, can you pause like that size? And and they paw you because it's just thinking cute when they start communicating. And then when they get grower and older and older and kind of are beyond your size, then that pause becomes the killer paw. So let me help you out here, Cherry, um, how to change that. So let's look a little bit from perspective of the dog. When, when, when we're dealing with dogs, 
and I know people says don't humanize dogs. Like, why would you humanize dogs? Like, they're animals. Really? Yes. They're animals. We are animals too. They're mammals. We are mammals too. Their emotional intelligence, we are emotional intelligence too. They drink coffee. No, they don't. We do. So there is a there are a couple of differences, of course. However, when we see a dog's from a dog's perspective, putting our you know human sense to that, we will recognize that dogs do things for a reason, either to gain more or to avoid things. So there are basically two directions to go. The dog does things because he has something in for him or he wants to avoid things. Obviously, when he paws on you, there are multiple reasons for that. We call them functional behaviors and they function a certain for a reason. So either he wants more of your attention or he wants to control you or he wants to hurt you not really, but sometimes. And sometimes they want to kind of like <laughs> lay you flat so he can hang out on you. Um, so we want to look for the usually reasons. The usually reason is to get your attention. And guess what? You're awarding them with your attention. So when we see the dog does something because he wants to get something and you don't understand the reason for that and you respond, without knowing it, you basically start rewarding it. So if your dog paws you and you push him away and he paws you and you're pushing away, obviously that reason is clear. He wants to get your attention and you just rewarded your dog for paying attention. So how to avoid that? First of all, we have to recognize that you cannot just cut off a behavior with a knife. It's not working like that because the dog gets frustrated. I see many times people says when a dog jumps on you or paws, you turn your back. This is actually rude. Why? Let me explain to you. Imagine you want to greet somebody and suddenly he turns his back. How do you feel about that? Avoidance. Yeah. No, actually, it's more than that. Is disgust. Like, ew, I don't greet you. What are you talking about? I'm walking my own business. So sending the dog that message is wrong because it's nothing wrong with your dog wanting to greet you. The way he wants to greet you is wrong. So we have to send a clear message, right? I see it all the time. People do turn their backs and then they get scratched on the back. Now, how did that work out for you? Doesn't, right? So, so we want to address the dog for the following reason. We want to teach the dog certain cues. First of all, what do we do upon arrival? Okay. What does the dog do and what are you doing? So we want to Teach the dog the expectations. So you have expectations and your dog has expectations. How can we meet both expectations on the right path? Okay. Again, this is Roman with Holistic Dog Training. And this is our Q&A from a holistic perspective. I'm a dog trainer and holistic behaviorist. And I would like to know where you guys are watching from. So we are answering um, Diane's, oh, sorry, Cherry's question about her Dane who's throwing his legs and paws and of course she gets slapped and bruised. So it's very important for the dog to recognize that that approach is not appropriate, but something else is appropriate. So we want to teach the dogs a change of behavior. We want to first offer an alternative behavior, showing him there's another option to do that. And once he learns the other options and he's more confident using the other option, then we diminish the old option that we didn't like. If you'd like that approach as we're talking right now, how about you click that like or heart, whatever you like to do. You're welcome to actively interacting with us, right? You just don't have coffee here and not sitting there on your side just drinking coffee. How about you communicate with us? So <clears throat> when we do that, we teach the dog that we appreciate an alternative behavior, which we will reward, and we don't appreciate the other behavior, which doesn't work. Okay, And this work, the dog will actually, on his own, choose the better option that you actually appreciate because the other option doesn't really work. So both win. Okay, Let's do this. You know your dog will come up and you know your dog will jump on you or will give you a paw. Right? That's common sense. We cannot expect that common sense from dogs because dogs have an episodic memory. <clears throat> Night it down. Episodic memory. You can Google it. <clears throat> you don't find a lot. But um, let me explain to you in a bit. Dogs' episodic memory, they remember events based on the sequence of those events. So, for example, you enter the door, you put your 
head on the rack or you put your back on your rack, you take your shoes off, the dog recognizes that you will stay at home. Why? Because that's what you always do. So if you make a change of that and you make a U-turn and go out without slippers, your dog is like, what did just happen? It doesn't make any sense, right? In other words, logic is not a dog thing. Logic doesn't actually work with dogs because it doesn't, it will not help them survive. It barely help us survive, right? Only thing we remember is things that made a huge impact to our life. And so we remember those for a very long time, even if we have Alzheimer's. So what we look for here is to create a sequence that a dog can easily remember. So we break it down in individual pieces. First of all, you come. When you come, you sit. And if you sit, you expect that something else to happen. So the dog does something and then he expects you to do something and then you expect him to do something and though it starts turning, okay? And all of a sudden you have, a, you have an event going on that happens between you and your dog. So we have a two-side communication, <clears throat> a two-way communication. The dog communicates with you and you communicate with your dog. If your dog doesn't have those communication skills, you're having a more serious issues because a dog only wants things his way and he doesn't really care about what you feel about things, okay? So <clears throat> answering your questions in complete sentence, when your dog comes up, you ask your dog to sit, okay? Offer him a treat, show him the sequence. You come, you sit, you get a treat. You take a treat, you toss it away. Your dog comes back again, gets another treat for sitting. Good job, here's another treat. And you toss him another treat. So what you do is you, Teach the dog to go away and come back. And your dog learns that he will come to you. It's likely to be seated because that would keep the things going. Then you can ask your dog other things to do. Like you can have him touch his muzzle again against your head. It looks like that. Touch. Your dog touches and then he gets a treat for that. I know. You know, my fake dog is kind of very handy to me. <coughs> so the next thing we want to look for is to reinforce that behavior. Now we're gonna bring that to the door. So you go outside the door, you close the door, you open the door, you all, your dog is like, eh? Good, here's a treat for not jumping. Perfect, see, you, you got it. You go outside, you open the door, you toss the treat, your dog comes up to you, he gets a treat. Now what you do is you take a treat, you toss the treat, you close the door, let your dog come back again to the door, you will be outside of the door. You open the door, you come in, and your dog is like, oh, we do that sit game. Jackpot, you got it, we do that sit game. So when I come into the door and you sit, you get a reward. Not only that, we're gonna have a game going on. So you leave and you come back again and so on. This doesn't work with two dogs because you eventually have a competition going on. Because of the situation of two dogs can get in a scruffle around the doorways and you have that problem, with dog jumping on you, I highly recommend you either message me or we schedule a session or two, making sure we set things right up because the last thing we want in a narrow space, one dog to start being territorial or reactive or food reactive or competitive to the situation and actually will kind of backfire the whole thing. So do not do that option when um, you have two dogs. Instead, I would like you to do is to cross your hands and please don't wear your cute pants and your cute shirts. Just cross your hands, you come in and you avoid looking at them until they sit. Good job, thanks. Treat, treat each one in their mouth for sitting. Now dogs aggravate each other, okay? They escalate each other. The next thing we wanna do <coughs> is to get away from that door hallway, get away of that weird situation, okay? Don't get stuck at the door. Walk away, don't look at your dogs, keep walking, put your bags on, then make a turn, let dogs be a little bit more roomy so they can move around, they don't want to get stressed. And then you cross your hands and avoid their look. You don't want to interact with them at that point. This is, well, I'm here waiting for your positive response. You can look down on the floor. That's a, it's a good indication of your, you're minding your business until they figure it out. Oh, good job, here you go, and everybody gets a treat both treats. So you want to be already loaded, okay? So we're gonna talk about that next time. Next one. Uh, ooh, you, I, you guys are really prepared. Thank you. Next, Carol Meader. 
my mater. Sorry if I spell your name wrong. Please help. Man, you need to call 911 if that's emergency, right? No, I'm just kidding. My four-year-old great Pyrenees is trying to attack. Ooh. Mm. That's serious. Okay, let's pay attention here. My four-year-old great Pyrenees is trying to attack my daughter's service Dalmatian anytime near me or near his bedroom. Okay, but doesn't attack our one-year-old husky. Shows teeth at him, though. He has to be put outside. Lots cause behavior. If we get between him and stop him from hurting Dalmatian, he lunges at my husband's face. Ooh, okay. So... <clears throat> Few things that are um, concerning. First of all, I need to. We need to talk. Okay, we need to sit down and talk and understand what's going on. Because a dog that goes after a person's face, it's mean intense injustice, and that dog responds to your husband in a way that he shouldn't. Okay, so he's very upset. So obviously there's something going on with the Dalmatian that he eventually does things your dog doesn't agree with or he's very needy. So we want to look very closely at what the situation exactly looks like. So what kind of service dog your Dalmatian is to your daughter? Is he trained? <clears throat> is he certified service dog? Um, there has he been through education kind of thing. What is exactly the service is doing to your daughter? And of course, it's not something you want to share in public right now. So it seems to me that something is off, that something you haven't seen correctly. I, I would not say that your Great Pyrenees is a bad dog and is an aggressive dog. There's something going on that we haven't cleared out yet. So please message me. We can talk about that. Now, Prozac and Great Pyrenees is not a good match because the dogs will react more intense because Prozac is affecting his emotions and around the event. So the dog needs to be in control and those Drugs, unfortunately, <clears throat> even though they are approved in other countries in the U.S., are not approved or are not tested for dogs. From my experience, those drugs are not a good deal with guardian breeds. So I understand where your doctor, doctor is coming from because it's a common, you know, anecdote that, you know, these particular drugs do change behaviors. Yes, they do but not in a such a knowledgeable way. There is there no scientific evidence behind that claim. So I would recommend get in touch with me, your private message me, or go to the, my email, holisticdogtraining.org, and contact me from there. So next. <clears throat> oh, quick tip on that. For now, do as you do and feel safe out of the situations. You know your dogs better than I do at that point, so keep them separate and we'll talk. Next, um, Christina, I have three dogs, the oldest being a Chihuahua, around 13 old. Yeah, you guys who have Chihuahuas, you know exactly. They will outlive you, so be careful. <clears throat> she slowed down in age and has some arthritis, etc., <clears throat> and really doesn't want to be bothered by the youngest of the pack. The youngest was raised with the other two from about eight months, and now is six years old. The issue is that that has arised is hostility, jealousy maybe, but aggression between the two. There have been a couple of severe interactions in which the Chihuahua was injured badly. So I'm in a very careful that we are kept apart and super, I cannot read further than that. Okay, so um, let, let me explain. Some dogs with age start having issues in general, so we, ger geriatric issues. So what we look for is we, we need to be careful of those dogs. We need to protect them for these youngest ones. The youngest ones really don't care. As long as you're on your legs and you can do things, you're pretty perfect good mate to play and some dogs get overwhelmed so the reason why they get overwhelmed because sometimes they have inflammations they have arthritis they have issues some of them have dementia and some of them forget the social rules and settings now if we add another dog in the family <clears throat> dynamics are changing and once the dog would be kind of like and i don't like the term you know the leader of the pack because dogs are not pack animals 
or at least they are so much pack animals as we are pack animals. So if you say the term pack animal, I'm, I, I assume, <clears throat> I assume you mean family. Um, even if those dogs are not directly family related, they live in family settings. And usually just give you a heads up, they live in diets. So each dog in a multiple family home setting will bond in diets. Dog number one, dog number two. Now here's what, how it works. And I know some people will like, what? Okay, listen to me up. The follower, the one who needs more information and the one who needs more knowledge and the one who needs mentoring will follow, will follow the one who has more knowledge and is more educational than anybody else. So if we say you have to pick the pack leader, which is, <clears throat> okay, it's like still new year, I'm still saving my bad words. You are not a leader if you don't have a follower. Who makes a follower? The one who trusts you, the one who learns from you, the one who can understand what you're talking about, okay? So the dog will follow the one who makes more sense to you. So if you have five dogs, all those five dogs will go into relationships based on diets. So dog, let's say dog number one connects with dog number two, dog number four connects with dog number three, now we have a fifth dog. Who is connecting with them? Well, each dog can connect with another dog. So even so we say diets and dog can connect with multiple dogs, there's always one dog who's following his partner, even if that dog is being followed by another partner. But this main relationship between the dog and his partner, looking upwards to a mentor, is followed towards the mentor, even if that Menti is being followed by another one. So we kind of have a chain reaction, which means all dogs may follow you, but all the dogs have also a relationship with each other, more or less in different levels of relationship, okay? So we have a relationship situations. And if you don't understand the relationship, you really don't understand why they're struggling with. <clears throat> one of my workshops that coming up, up soon <clears throat> is about in interspecies relationships between the do dogs with each other, same species relationships, and how those disputes can come up in different ways. So I categorize five types of relationship issues that can happen um, in multiple dogs and the reasons why they get in fights about it. So stay tuned there and if you want to follow me, you're gonna get notified, <clears throat> which means you have to click on follow him and get notifications, you know, blah, blah, things, Facebook stuff. <clears throat> Or you follow me on, on YouTube and get notifications there too, either way. My YouTube uh, link is at holisticdogtraining.org. And of course, you're welcome. Um, the next thing we want to look for is understanding who is cooperating with whom and who is letting go. Now, of course, you have to protect your senior dog. And let me pull up so I don't want to make any mistake on explaining things. And so... I did one thing I wasn't sure exactly, the youngest was raised. Um, who shows jealousy and aggression between those two, okay? Now, one thing that I also see between dogs, retired dogs that are kind of not actively interacting in those groups, they kind of start separating themselves. Um, they're be seen by the other dogs are not functioning members of the family. You know what? It's kind of like with us people, when one of the family members always come from get gifts in Christmas and never sends a card, and I was like, oh, he's back again? Does he need anything again? Is he kind of looking out for money or something? So we see from that perspective that we judge the situation. Yes, dogs do see when things are not done correctly. Dogs do see if a dog is more needy than he should be. And dogs see that we are unfair to their interactions. And so if we treat an older dog with a specific gestures that are not appropriate for that social settings that you actually set up, that will cause issues because these dogs will, why is he getting attention? He's doing anything all day, we're doing the job, he doesn't bark, he doesn't do anything right. Why is he getting attention? And don't get me wrong, 
dogs don't have that ego that we have. They don't say, why not me? They're questioning why he is getting what he gets if he's not compliant to the family code of conduct. Yes, I said that, family code of conduct. So dogs have a family code of conduct in their family systems and they have a family code of conduct with you. The problem is if those family code of conducts are not in alignment with a complete family setting. So the dogs have a different code than you have and you try to implement your code and they do their code and all of a sudden you have a dispute going on and you're not seeing what's going on here because you're having different rules. So that said, let me check in with your follow-up question. Yeah, um, I, I see where you're coming from. Yes, the dynamic has changed. So what we have to do is we have to reestablish a family code of conduct. We have to put things back in place. Who does what, why, with whom, for what reason, and what are the needs? Are the needs are met? Are the needs met? And then do they want a lot? <clears throat> what is this one coming from? So in multiple family settings, we have also trauma involved. Okay, early puppy stages, puppy trauma ancestor trauma that comes in. I know people like turning their eyes over ancestor trauma. <laughs> what the park is he talking about? Ancestor trauma can come down the generations, that genetic information up to 17 generations. That is scientifically speaking. I've seen collective trauma being expressed by dogs. Okay. That happens, especially you guys who are more into energy work and are aware of ancestor trauma and how this works in the collective. You know what I'm talking about? So, I suggest, suggest we should do an archetype reading. Let, let me explain that because people are kind of like, what? I do card readings on the dog? Yes. So archetype readings is an intuitive thing where we use multiple cards and each card represents a particular attribute to a particular dog. Okay. So for example, unconsciously, I was thinking of your dog who is very needy and I get the beggar guard. Meaning is, if that would be a session and if I would look into very closely um, and you know get a setting on it, I would say, your dog eventually is a beggar. He always wants things for you. He's basically needy, but he's being isolated by the other dogs because of that neediness. So, yeah, well, what was that? Right, Lindsay, right? So, um, yeah, I'm not a psychic. However, I use intuition and I use um, proxy. So the cards will be the proxy so I can pull in that energy that represents each individual dog and its characteristic and we can map it out. For you guys who are trainers or behaviorists and you haven't heard of that, guys, this is tough stuff, right? Super interesting. Um, I use archetype cards, I think for the last five years Incredibly informative, especially if you have no clue what the situation is. Blank slate, okay? So, um, that said, archetype reading will help us understand what the underlying cause is. And we also will pull cards for you in particular, so we see what is your relationship to your particular dogs. Now, don't take me wrong, these cards will be as is condition. If you make a different choice and you make a different change in your life and make different decisions, those energies will shift and move because as you move through your own trauma and your own guilt and your own fears and your own confidences and your own ideas through that family system, those dogs adjust accordingly, right? Um, and so those cards are very flexible. So if we would pull every day a new card, it's because different things will happen every day and the situations will changing. So this is basically just a screenshot of a situation that it is. However, I can see even if we pull different cards, the, the relationship to those cards are very similar to each other, even if the individual archetype um, attribute changes, the, the, the idea behind that is always the same. So we have, for example, a teacher, we have a healer, we have a companion. So teachers are more dominant cards. For example, um, let's pull a card. And I think we should do actually a class around archetype reading because you guys should actually know about stuff. So we have a lover, 
for example, is definitely something that is a healer card. We have a queen that's definitely something who is a teacher card. We have an angel something that's definitely more a companion. We have a magical child, which is likely a companion. We have a destroyer, for example, who is a, heal, a teacher. So with the, all these individual cards have categories in themselves. And so even if you pull a different card, but they come usually from the same category, you still get the same information, how the dynamics are working. So um, archetype reading is something not really new. It's very old. Um, the, uh, Freud had a conversation about that. And ancient Greek guys had a conversation about that. Whole theater is based on those archetypes, right? And whole healing, as, uh, healing modalities are connected about those archetypes. So, um, that was my answer to your question. I think we should look closer into the dynamics because you have a lot of dogs and I feel there's a lot of drama going on and I don't want you to make any mistakes. Um, one session will be pretty good to get a handle on it. So let's see who we had next. Um, we have Christina. How do you like our Q&A? Yes, it's time to click the button. Thumbs up, hearts. Or if you don't like it, you can hate it, absolutely, hate that video. And you know, but maybe there was something in for you at some point, even if you hate it, maybe some information comes in and comes very handy. So, um, yes, touching is a useful thing. It gets out of, <laughs> you know what? Touch is very important, especially for dogs who have trauma with their hands. And it's not that you push your dogs fist in his face, you offer your hand and your dog is coming up to touch your hand, which means the dog chooses you to touch. He touches you because of his own choice and is not being petted. I know people reach out with their hands, oh, take that treat. That's so violent, Jesus. It's kind of like, here, take the flowers. And you're like, whoa, man, hey, thanks for the flowers, but maybe kind of give me some space. Don't push it in my face, right? Um, Lindsay, <laughs> yeah, I appreciate it. You're welcome to share it. Um, we're not talking crap, okay? I know sometimes things are being beyond science, but you know what? Science catches up, okay? In the past, we would say dogs don't have emotions, and now science says, well, dogs have a lot of emotions, as emotional as at least a five-year-old. Emotions such guilt is also included. Okay, speaking of guilt, reminder, next Saturday, we're going to do a special. We're going to talk about how forgiveness helps you with your dog's behavior. Okay, so, um, yes, we got that. Lindsay, yes, I agree with you. So, did this make sense so far? Do you guys have any other questions? Did I miss anyone? Where are you guys watching from? Come on. I see 12 people here watching. And I know more of you will watch later because Saturday you guys have things to do, like making breakfast, dropping up the kids to school, uh, to, to gyms, whatever you guys do. Um, and I would like to see where you guys are from. I know we have people from England. I know we have people from Texas. We have people from Oregon. Wisconsin, here you go. Connecticut. Hello to Connecticut. <laughs> I used to be in Greenwich, Connecticut. Um, so here we go. Who's that? My eight-month-old peer doesn't resource card anything, has just started growling us regarding daughter. Ooh, okay. So I would like to know about your daughter. How old is she? And in which occasions? is your dog responding to your daughter? What is your daughter doing that your dog is responding? <clears throat> and in that age, around eight, <clears throat> there are multiple things happening at the same time. So dog not only is dealing with fear of his environment, he's also afraid of strangers. So sometimes people behave weird. Um, <clears throat> sometimes, um, hmm. So, your dog starts growling at your daughter he's, when he's laying on her. 
Hmm. Okay. That's kind of complex. There are two main reasons why that happened. A, he doesn't like her to move. B, he wants her to move. A, point one, he wants her to move because he, she is on his safe space, meaning she occupies his place. Oh, that makes sense. <clears throat> okay, so he's basically guarding her. Now, I know it's personal, and maybe you want to message me about that. I would like to have a little bit of a more insight about your daughter's emotional behavior history, kind of like a little bit a short thing. And if you guys have any arguments with your daughter um, <clears throat> or your daughter feels depressed or in any other way, your dog feels the need to protect her. So sometimes children in that age are going through different depression phases in school, friends, you know, you not know, get enough sunlight, they really get depressed and they worried about things. And the parents come in and the kids kind of like, <laughs> That attitude can trigger the dog to start guarding the child. Sometimes we also see the child's um, had arguments with parents, and so the dog feeling the need to guard the child of eventually connection. I'm not saying you guys have these issues. I'm just saying sometimes dogs see things weird ways. They don't have this, you know, common sense logic that we expect them to have. If two people are hugging each other and they're very loud about it, like I'm Greek and if I do things, I'm very loud about it and my hands are moving and people are like, just don't move your hands, man. You almost hit me twice, right? Think dogs can see those things as aggressive interactions with each other and so they judge it wrong. And so all of a sudden we are in a target. So one thing that I would like to see here, um, we want to look for how is your daughter responding to um, your dog's reaction. Okay, thank you. Um, without directing it to you, we're gonna explain a few things that can happen in the past, I've seen it, okay? So I've seen many people who have uh, adopted dogs from rescue uh, or adopted dogs from friends, and those dogs eventually came in from um, a very complex situation domestic violence, for example, where the dog was actually actively part of guarding and protecting a person of an abuser or another partner, that the dog would be likely adopted out or, you know, being rehomed for obviously aggression reasons. And that dog goes into a new family and start creating the, the same partners. So what happens, <coughs> sorry, the dog goes into an unhealthy relationship with one of those people. Okay, so we call it sometimes survival relationship. So the dog, once he bonds with a particular person, he feels if he's not guarding that person, these persons will go away and that dog will die. Extreme situations. So insecure attachment relationships usually can cause multiple reasons. So the dog likely has an issue building attachment relationships and that needs support. It's not something you should correct, something you should punish, something you should kind of click it or reward it away. It's something that you have to look very closely what the main reason and the main trauma happened. Sometimes it's a complex trauma. Sometimes it's a PTSD response. As soon as one person is triggered of being kind of anxious about something, feeling guilty <clears throat> about something, the dog is triggered and thinks the reason why the person feels guilty is because those people's coming in. I, I remember I had a situation um, back in 2012 from a person who was very um, in need of medical attention and support. Um, and the mother was the person who gave that person this medical support. I cannot go into details because you could link those to that particular person. Uh, that person is not alive anymore. And um, those dogs responded to the helper in a bad way. The reason why is because the person um, that was is in, in conversation had medical issues and the person wouldn't take those medical prescription drugs, which caused her to feel anxious every time the mother would come in, in case the mother will figure that out. 
So all of a sudden the dogs associated, which all of them dogs were service dogs, individual service dogs for individual tasks. So this person had three or four dogs. I keep that flu so you cannot pinpoint. Um, and those dogs basically start reacting towards the mother. So we had to find out that there was a lot of trauma involved in that family setting. And those dogs on this person had a PTSD response in those emotions, would trigger anxiety, would trigger one dog and then trigger the other dog. And all of a sudden the whole thing escalated. Okay, we got things under control. So we once we recognized what the situation was, we were able to figure that out. <clears throat> so, um, Carol, in addition to my previous comments, sometimes appear in me as will attack out of nowhere. Okay. In my world, out of nowhere doesn't exist. Usually it's out of our understanding. I totally agree with you on that. Um, the Dalmatian and Pyrenees can both be sleeping in the living room and the Pyrenees just gets up and lunges for him randomly. There seems to be no trigger for it. Okay, that would make sense if we have a sleeping disorder. A sleeping disorder, okay? Um, rage is a weird thing. It has to be closely observed. And one thing I can give you a heads up before we talk, start keeping records. Remember all the events that happened in the past. We may find a pattern to those. So for now, I would recommend your Pyrenees should sleep in a confined place. Um, for example, around that usually nightly attack time um, or sleeping order, sleeping disorders. So when the dog wakes up and he has a nightmare and he gets up and sees somebody, he can be triggered. Now, the reason why Dalmatians have those skin marks are specific and some dogs don't really make a sense of that sight. You remember camouflage? It has a reason why it is that because it camouflages in this environment. I, I don't think I know of a scientific related evidence-based research, but Anecdotal, I'm just sharing with you. I have the feeling that the reason why Dalmatian are like that is because for environmental hiding towards predators. So I would, I would for now at least, keep your Pyrenees safe from himself. Maybe you want to have him in a closed area. Um, maybe a, a proper sized crate would be very helpful in that transition time until we find a better pattern to that and kind of figure it out. Medication to your dog, I don't think it's a good idea because it can cause other side effects, which is not research. That's why I'm saying, you know, uh, FDA has not approved um, many medications that for, are addressed for humans, uh, for dogs. Yes, they're being tested on animals for their health effects, but not for their emotional effects. Good. Um, who was that? Yes, Christina. Um, you know, it is. And, and that COVID, man, worldwide, we have a serious behavior issues coming up in different um, fields. I, I, I talk with colleagues internationally. I had colleagues in Asia, colleagues in Europe. And, and we have discussions like, there are new things coming up we haven't seen before. Dogs who are super well behaved suddenly starts becoming aggressive. We know the reasons, but we always try to understand how exactly can we educate people to be proactive rather than reactive. So, and I know, you know, with all these um, restrictions of not, especially you guys in England, the restrictions are very, very narrow. So you wouldn't not be able to take your dog out for a walk unless he's in your backyard. Socialization is down to zero. And those dogs in this early puppyhood, especially for Pyrenees or guardian breeds or mastiff breeds or um, large breed dogs like Cane Corsos, Presa Canario, Great Danes, English Mastiffs, Bull Mastiffs, Pres Dog Argentino, Great Pyrenees, Marema, you name it. All those guardian and large breed working dogs have issues with it, okay? And in their development stages where they need that social interactions, they're isolated and they only know family and they don't know what a stranger means. And especially when you guys hit eight to nine months old and you now you start getting out, now the poop hits the fan and you guys don't know what to do with it because you haven't seen it coming, but it, they're coming up. And if you guys are in my group, 
holistic dog training and parenting, um, you will see that I having a proactive approach. We want to teach the dog proactively to pay attention to us, to reach out to us for help if they feel struggling. So if your dog would feel threatened by a situation, the first thing he would do is turning to you and like, hey, I'm gonna lose my shit right now. Can you help me? And you're like, oh, I got you, buddy. Let's walk out of here. Okay, now that you feel more safe, let's go check it out again. And so teaching your dog that proactively is what training sessions should be for. And you don't need to go outside of your home to prepare your dog. You should be able to prepare your dog in your home before you go to a vet visit. You should be able to prepare your dog before you leave the house. You will be able to prepare your dog before he meets other dogs. Okay, the preparation is magic. You don't, nobody put you in a car and says, go drive, have fun. Let's figure out how we drive on a highway. No, you're going to sit down. You're going to learn the rules of driving. You're going to learn the technical aspect of that. And once you have learned that, then you're going to sit in the car, driving a parking lot right and left, try to handle things and try to coordinate your brain with your hands, with your mouth, with your guts, with your feelings. And so your dog can adjust to that. So if I say, let's go, what does it mean to your dog? And I know many families, we have these conversations all the time where each family member comes up with his own jargon. Like, oh, buddy, let's go. Buddy, let's go is different than, hey, sweetie, let's go. Or come. So you have two th or three different words that mean the same thing and your dog has to figure out what exactly do they want. Then we have those obedience commands, sit. And then we have sit, sit. And then we had sit, damn it. Oh, wait a minute, which one do you want me to do? The sit, the sit, sit, or the sit, damn it. Make sense? So we have all these multiple commands because we associate them with different emotions. And because dogs are emotional intelligence, they associate those commands with your emotions. So if you're not crazy and super mad at him, he doesn't have to sit. Yeah, you created it. <laughs> that didn't, your dog didn't create that. And that's why I say, if you have, if you teach your dog commands, it's not because um, not because things are so weird with dogs and they are so strange, but because dogs are emotionally intelligent and they have episodic memory. They know, they recognize if that happens, this happens. And if that happens, then that happens. And all of a sudden it becomes a chain reaction of things and the dog starts having a predictability. He can predict what you're up to. If you come already with that attitude, like four o'clock in the afternoon being done with work and you come home and those guys are freaking out and food is not done yet and the dirt is in the yard and nobody cleaned up the poop and you come already with that energy in there and everybody's like, oh my God. Of course your response will be different. But you know what? Tough shit. You come to your home, you have to take control of your, your emotions. Okay. If you cannot handle your emotions, you cannot expect your dog to handle those emotions. And I work with people also as mentor, and I have also colleagues working with me. When we're talking about stuff, I want people to go through their own traumas and start seeing how the dogs are triggering their traumas and their frustration and their anger. Right? Healer, teachers, companion, remember what we talked about before? There's a whole idea behind that. A teacher can trigger you to deal with your emotions because energetically you called in that particular dog to help you going through that ascension process for you guys who are a little bit more into a healing aspect. And then you have a healer who the healer wants you to heal from your trauma and your pain and is there to comfort you and slightly shows you how it would feel like if you would change. And then we have the companion who is just here to be a person of you, you know what, because you feel lonely. How many companion dogs live with elder people? And how many companion dogs cannot be good blind dogs, but they're great emotional support dogs? And why teachers are not as good as a, <clears throat> um, service dogs? Because they're very rough and abrupt in their response. So things to know. Yes, I appreciate Karen for your feedback. Um, coffee talks. <laughs> yeah, you know what? I, I, I watched a, a series with um, a, a comedian. Um, comedian having coffee and talking about cars. And I kind of like, you know what? 
and I had a lot of colleagues coming up. So now with COVID, everybody got very busy because all of them are understaffed and everybody's busy, you know, dealing with situations. And I'm just being alone having coffee. So if you are a professional and and you have a holistic approach in things, it doesn't matter if you're a nutritionist or if you are <clears throat> a therapist or <clears throat> if you are in any way um, a person who who is dedicated to your breed and you want to kind of share your information and share your knowledge with, with me, let's sit together, have some coffee and, and talk about, we would talk with each other and answer questions. Because I feel if we're open-minded and we talk about that things without coming in like, oh, let me tell you what I know and you don't know. That's just, you know, it's not like that. Because you know things that I don't know. And I know things that I know doesn't mean I'm perfect, doesn't mean I'm right, but sometimes I just know things. Sometimes I just channel things, I just know things. And I'm like, where is it coming from? Uh, Why well, doesn't make any sense? Okay, let me look at that. So I do some research and indeed I found like, oh, wait a minute. Oh, okay, that makes sense. Oh, oh, there's already a scientific evidence on that. Oh, okay, I'll take that. So sometimes my higher smarter self, I usually listen. Um, <laughs> I appreciate Karen. Um, sometimes my high smart self steps in and takes over in some talks. And I was like, did I say that? <laughs> sometimes I watch my own videos and I was like, wow. Okay. I'll, I'll have to remember that. And that's why I record all my, I also record my sessions. So if I have a client online sessions, I do record all my sessions. And sometimes I have to go back in because I literally don't remember what I said. It just comes down as the situation goes in. And especially if you do archetype, archetype reading, it's not something I think about, something that naturally comes in. It would just convey information as it comes in. And I can literally see the mapping from a different perspective. It's not, I don't know you. I don't know your dog. I really don't care about your dog and your family at all. Just kidding. Of course I do. I, I love... I love you guys and I appreciate you guys for being here and spending time here while having a coffee. I wish you'd be next to us. Maybe we can get a whole group. I cannot get more than 10 people here on a, on a group. But if you guys want to sit together, maybe not, not next time, but the time after, message me and say, hey, you know what? I want to hang out with you having coffee. Important. You need to have a coffee. Yes, yeah, Steve, I'm, I'm with you in a bit. <laughs> Steve Palco, National Great Pyrenees Rescue, is the go-to person for National Great Pyrenees Rescue. It goes back to um, behavior of Great Pyrenees. And he's an awesome guy. So if you have a Pyrenees and you think I'm awesome, you haven't met Steve yet. <laughs> so uh, I would definitely follow that. Oh, our session today. I don't, I don't see on Facebook who you are. It may show up on Facebook, but it doesn't show on my screen on StreamYard. So if you add your name, that would be very helpful so I know where to refer to. Um, yes, Carol, I appreciate you guys. So I want you guys to be safe. Uh, in 2000, it's 122021. 122021 today. One, two, two, zero, two, one, today. It's kind of like, I call it perfect. <laughs> so, um, happy new year. Guys, get your dog training shit together. Okay. If you need help, reach out. If you don't like me, don't reach out. At least listen or at least read about it. Um, if you want to hire somebody, no show today. Steve, are you kidding me? No show today. Okay, guys. You just got yourself another 15 minutes. So follow-up question. Steve, do you have a question? Hey, Barbara. Oh, yeah, I got gotcha. you. <laughs> good, good. Um, so since everybody wants to schedule a session, let's talk about how virtual sessions work. First of all, virtual session is pretty similar. Like picture this, I am on the other side of the table, just like you're watching me right now. In between us, there is a large table. The good thing is you cannot reach out to me because that table is big. Okay. Oh man, I'm so sorry. Oh Jesus. I missed that part. Man, I wish your wife 
quick recovery, okay? Get her some treats, some flowers. I'm sending you some energy work there. If anybody of you guys is a Reiki master, healer, or any other way can help uh, Steve with his wife, picture Steve, okay? And his directly connected wife, okay? Steve has to give permission um, to do that. So if Steve gives us permission, we're happy to send you some energy work towards your wife for quick recovery. Will that make a miracle? We don't know, but we do our best to give as much energy possible for her to ping up and running again, okay? So um, a quick moment for Barbara, uh, for Steve's wife. Sorry, I thought Barbara got stuck in my brain. Yeah, not COVID. Whatever that is, doesn't really matter. Whatever is the best and highest good for your wife, that should happen um, in, in best and highest good. Good. Okay, now um, let's talk about a little bit online training. <clears throat> I know many people are weird about online training. And let me explain. I had no clue it works. I had no clue. In Back in 2009, <clears throat> I had a session, a tapping session. Tapping. Tapping. A tapping session with a practitioner over the phone, over Skype back then. And I was like, somebody convinced me to do that. And I was like, how can a person help me over distance watching me on Skype? And she's like, yeah, you do this and you do that and you do this and you do that. And I'm supposed to feel better about it? Like, what the crap? And it, I did feel better about that. Yes, I did. I, I, have, I have complex trauma. And so I had to work out different stuff. And so she helped me bring those stuff up. And I was like, holy bark. How is it possible that somebody on the other side of the internet, like if you follow that line here and trace that line all the way back to the other end, there's another person trying to tell you things. And I, this, this mistrust comes in because we, we live in a 3D world, okay? That if I don't see your dog, I don't know what your dog does. If I don't touch your dog, how can I train your dog? If I don't technically speaking, giving a dog treat, how can I help your dog? But guess what? Exactly. Jan had been through that process. I have been, I worked with Jan. I don't know if Jan wants to share the, the story, how we met and how we ended up working together, how we started online. And the situation was really, really complicated. And then we got a donation from a very generous donator um, and I was able to come to Jen and help her in person because I wanted to learn from that very, very, very complicated situation, multiple traumas involved, a very sad story. So maybe Jen at some point can share a link to the story or the link to the events, a video eventually from um, the RV chase in LA and all the stories after that. And so we had to work remotely for safety reasons. But at the same time, because the dog was still in bonding mode, we needed, we needed to get certain things in place without the dogs being triggered. Perfect, Steve, exactly. And so I remember colleagues telling me, like laughing at me, like, you cannot train a dog online. If you're not there assessing the situation, like how would you be able to assess the situation? I was like, you know what? Who knows the dog better than I do? You don't know the dog better than I do as a trainer, but his handler knows the dog better than I do. And his parent knows the dog better than I do. And the whole family knows the dog better than I do. The problem is they don't see all those things. So if I'm able to show them what to look for, the dogs already trust them. And the people already have a relationship, sorry, with the dog. Then suddenly, it's like me being there. The people become my eyes and ears and my feelings. So if I tell people, you know, how do you feel your dog right now? And the people says, he feels anxious to me. I can tune into that and feel how the dog feels like 
not because she told me how she feels, because I confirm how I feel in the quantum field about her dog feeling towards her. So if you talk about quantum field, meaning is quantum entanglement, if you connect with your mind, with a dog that you have a picture with, that's why in my online sessions I ask a picture, then I technically speaking, I am connected in a quantum entanglement as much as the owner. Not as in a good relationship as the owner, but as close as possible. Now, I can tune in and feel things as the dog can feel me too. Now, you guys who are energy practitioners and do remote energy work, you know exactly what I'm talking about. When you do Reiki on a dog, you basically create this tango connection, this cord connection. And if you start getting divorced from your partner and you still think in that direction, you have a connection. We're basically all interconnected. So the online training, what it does is it goes through that connection and I'm with you at the time of that session, throughout all the session. And what I do is basically try to create a better connection, clear out those connection routes between you and your dog by helping you guys communicate better. Take away all this debris of miscommunication and, and suspiciousness. I don't know if I use that term correctly, being suspicious and you know, these weird feelings about each other, right? And once we have eliminated that, then all of a sudden we have a two-way communication. So first is one-way communication, and then is the other way communication. And then we have a two-way communication, and then we have a group communication. So what we want to establish here is the dog to raise his level of communication, not because of me, but because of you. Because I'm not his partner, I'm not, I'm not his caregiver, you are. So if I would come into your house and take over your dog, and you're like, wow, that guy is good, right? What does it give to you? What is it, what's your benefit? Zero. How does your dog benefit from it? Zero. Yes, your dog will do everything I ask him to do because I'd be able to connect very quickly. But if I leave with that, you would be still the same person. And your dog relationship with you would be still the same. But I would have a better relationship with your dog and your dog will learn more from me. How do you like that? Not really, right? So I observed over time that if I was there in person and I work with that, then I recognize that people were relying on me. Oh, okay. And I become the crutch. I don't want to be your crutch. Do I look like a crutch? No. What I want is to start relying on yourself and not believing in that things that, oh, you know, you're not a trainer, you cannot handle your dog. What? If you're not a behaviorist, what? There's no better behaviorist and no better trainer than a secure attachment relationship your dog has with you. All we have to do is build that secure attachment relationship, right? So if you have a problem with your partner in your house, your husband, your wife, your sibling, and I would come in as a behaviorist, try to help you guys out. And I start having a relationship with your partner. What? See? But what I have to do as a, as, a, as a behaviorist, I have to help you guys communicate first, right? Do I have to be in person there to help you guys communicate? Sometimes people feel the need to have somebody there because they feel the comfort of the presence. Guess what? We have COVID. How does it work out for you so far? It doesn't. So now you're trapped. You need help and I can help you and there's a distance. We can close the distance. All you have to do is you call in and we start working out. There's a questionnaire attached to it. It's pretty long, pretty intensive. People who have already joined one of my sessions know exactly how long that is and how much information. Oh, I didn't think of that. Oh, now that you're seeing questions now, recognize there's a pattern to it. I will use that questionnaire as a base so I can see kind of the tendencies. And I have two other questionnaires. If the dog is aggressive or has a bite history, we're going to see the breed, breed traits. So we see which time of the breed traits are more in alignment and which one are off the charts. So those two together and then in our consultation between you and me and whoever family member is involved with that, we're going to learn some truths nobody knew about stuff. Mm-hmm. 
because we're going to look at the history pattern, behavior history, okay? And then we see some repetitions there. People didn't assume that, oh, oh, right, yeah, it does make it. Oh, now it makes sense, right, the thing. And then once we have that set, then we start creating common language for everyone. Now the dogs start trusting everyone. And now we can create a family code of conduct. Because the dog trusts our commands and our rules, now the dog starts to be compliant to those. Right? And once the dog is compliant to those rules, most of your problems disappear to start with. Suddenly your dog will be more obedient. Why? Because you can get his attention without rewarding your dog or without punishing your dog. Because many people use the dog's name. Right? Woofy, come. Hmm. Woofy is thinking. Oh. Huh. She's dressed. She wore her shoes. I see the car keys. She wants me to come in. <laughs> I'm not coming. Right? So he can associate Woofy with problem. Then, Woofy, bad dog. And suddenly, Woofy becomes a positive reinforcement trigger and a negative reinforcement trigger, meaning is Woofy becomes a marker, a positive or a negative marker. How stupid is that? Something that you should use as holy in your relationship, the dog's name is a holy word that only should associate comfort and love and appreciation. It's been connected to punishment or reward based on your dog's perception. So if your dogs feel guilty, his name will be a punishment. If your dogs feel proud, your word name would be his reward. So your dog is barking down the fence and is attacking people and you're calling his name and it's like, <laughs> really? Now, if you would be able to get your dog's attention, neutral, so it's not a punishment, it's not a reward, but clearly identifies, hey, I'll give you a better job description than that. Then all of a sudden, we have a clear distinction of that job is not appreciated. Nothing wrong with you doing the job. You are very welcome to do your job, but I'm not paying for it. I'll pay you for another job. In order to get that job that you will appreciate, I would like you to do something for me in exchange. Thank you for coming. Thank you for sitting. I didn't even have to tell you because you know that the job that I have to give you is being rewarded, but that job that you just did was not. So all of a sudden we see that working dogs want to be appreciated and they want to have a freaking job and you're yelling and screaming on their jobs. It's not helping them. Do I need to be there to explain to you that? Have you learned nothing so far? So if you learned a little bit through our conversation here, imagine how much you would learn when we talk about your particular case, sitting down, have your particular questionnaire, seeing, working with your particular dog and you learn tools and skills for your particular family and situation and your particular family will sit together and we learn particular things that matches to your family system and your family habits and your family dog how would you benefit from that right and plus you're going to save yourself a lot of money because that knowledge will stay with you and that knowledge will stay with your kids and that knowledge would stay with your dog you don't need to send your dog out for boarding and training freaking boot camp what is it a boot kicking ass camp what are the credentials what are the tools they use behind closed doors the reviews tell me nothing there are more serious reviews on amazon that you can read on google why because i can buy reviews i can buy pay people buy reviews give me a review all you have to do is google and find my address and then Google will up the ranking because it's obviously I arrived there because I Googled it. And you know, these matrix systems that every you know platform has to verify the user and credit, give it credibility, right? And you buy it. And then those people who have no clue about dog training and behavior see the miracle happen, not seeing how the dog is suffering into that miracle. And then they give them five-star reviews because they think the dog is perfect. Well, the dog is living in a trauma, drama, and he's, he's afraid to be a dog anymore. And he's just there being afraid to making a move. Well, that is worth a five-star review for the person, but not for the dog. So therefore, you are in control what's happening to your dog. 
it's happening in front of you in real time without anybody interfering in it. It happens with your consent. It happens with your dog consent. It happens because everybody in the family agrees with it. There is no hidden agenda. All my sessions are available on demand. If you want them, you can look at it. I'm not hiding anything. You learned as much as I did, your dog did, and everybody in your family did, and it never will go away again. It will be your knowledge. Even if I die, you still have that knowledge, and you can recreate that in every other dog you will have in the future. Theoretically speaking, you'll be your own trainer slash behaviorist for all the dogs you will have in the future. Would you be perfect? Of course not. You don't have that experience of multiple breeds, but you know what? If you go through this process, creating trust, building a relationship, start creating family code of conduct, generalizing, you're 99% on the spot with any species you're going to work with, even with humans, because that's how mammals work. If they don't trust you, they don't do things for you. If they don't trust you, they eventually may kill you. If you're not family, you are a stranger and eventually a danger. And if you don't have any rules, they will create rules. So it's kind of like common sense. But you know, some people make that a science, so complicated. And so there's all these terms and scientific course, they don't even know to explain it. Do you know that aggression is not a clear definition? So if, you, if we sit down together like 15 or 20 behaviorists and scientists and psychologists, and we analyze the term aggression, we were done with a third cup of coffee and we have not the same conclusions yet because everybody sees aggression from his own perspective because aggression you cannot actually measure there's no measurement for aggression it's a perception so if i'm a victim you're an aggressor yeah you like it or not i call you an aggressor you are one in my reality so if your dog you think is aggressive and I tell you, I don't think your dog is aggressive. And you tell me, well, trainers told me he's aggressive and my pet sitter told me my dog is aggressive and my veterinarian told me my dog is aggressive and my behaviors and trainer told me my dog is aggressive. I was like, mm -hmm. okay, what exactly was the, oh, that's what he did. Cool. Okay. Let's look closer into that. Why did it happen? Before we actually call it a name. Because name calling can everyone. You don't need to have a PhD. You don't have to have a title. You don't have to have experience. You just call it a name. Blah. It's kind of like throwing up things. That's not what we do. Between you and me, sitting here, having that conversation, I need to know as much as you know. I need to know what happened last week. I need to know if you had vaccinations on your dog. I need to know if you kicked your dog. I need to know if you have anger issues and sometimes you get it out of your dog. Yes, I need to know that. Why? Because it's important. Because if you don't recognize that, your dog will and your dog will hurt you for that. And I don't want you to get hurt because I want that dog to stay with your house and you guys have a relationship. So I need to know things and I will ask questions. And those people who work with me, I make clear in the beginning, if you're not honest with me, we will not be able to work because I will be honest to you. Whatever I get, I will tell you. I don't tell you you're a jerk. Of course not. I'm very polite about stuff. But at some point, you will recognize, like, oh, man, I fucked up. You said it, right? Anyway, I'm not, I'm not blaming anyone. My job is not to blame things. I'm, my job is to bring things to surface, show it to you how it looks like, and then, exactly, Steve, then we see whether or not your dog is aggressive. Because likely, as Steve correctly sees, Dogs are reactive. They react to things. If dogs don't have a problem, they hang out doing nothing. <laughs> have you seen a bulldog snoring at night? Hilarious. Don't drink coffee while watching those videos. <laughs> you're going you're gonna to destroy the whole screen with your coffee, <laughs> you know, things. So, yes, there are dogs who can be aggressive. But those dogs have... Have, have, have neurological issues. They have cancer. They are not in control of their emotions. How many of those are out there? In my practice, I met maybe two, three, if I remember. 
three dogs, aggressive, literally out of nowhere, like for no reason, all of a sudden, some issues. Yes, as we saw before, some dogs can have rage. Some dogs have um, sleeping disorders. Sometimes dogs, when they wake up in the transition time from the dream into the reality, that switching point is an illusion. So they're not sure if they're awake or not. Dogs don't recognize. I don't know if they do. I never had a one-on-one -on -one conversation like Freud sitting asking questions. Do you recognize the reality from your dreams? Where, where exactly is that threshold? No, we don't know. However, I can see things where dogs basically after the event show remorse. We're going to talk about that next week. Show remorse. And then you recognize he was not aware of that reality. What he saw coming into his eyesight and how the brain worked it out, in addition to his trauma, he thought he's being attacked. He thought he's going to get killed. Of course he's going to kill first. And maybe some of you guys are police officers. Do you sleep with your gun under your pillow? How many times have you wanted to draw a gun under your pillow or from your drawer, recognizing that one of your family members came in unannounced and you're like, shit. I'm going to shoot that guy. So, <laughs> Steve, come on, give me a break. I shouldn't have even click on it, posting it. I, I do feel confident what I do. Am I the best on the planet? Of course not. Um, I want more people to be better than I am. I want people to be better than I am. I have no problem with that. I want to learn from people who are better than I am because I don't think... I am the limit at all. I, I I do things weird and change and different. And sometimes I tap into things that don't make any sense to me at the beginning. And then I was like, wait a minute. My smart says dig deeper. And I start digging deeper and I was like, oh, wow. Okay. And then I call one of my colleagues. I says, dude, what about that? And he's like, what? What are you talking about? Huh, let me think about that. And then they call me later. It's like, oh yeah, right. Um, well, we're not using these particular words, but yeah, you're right. I think you're on the right spot here. I had a friend, um, a colleague, friend. No, we were not personal friends, but um, uh, he was kind of like a person who, who helped me trust myself into that kind of integrative stuff. His name is um, Behan, and he actually died recently. Um, my condolences. So Kevin Behan... Um, also known for his book, um, Natural Dog Training, basically helped me believe what shit I said about stuff. And he started talking about energy in a very interesting way. Something that's very difficult to kind of wrap your mind around that because it's coming from a very technical perspective. And his, his uh, family uh, business, many years in dog training, um, war dogs for military purposes and police. So this guy really, really knew what he was doing. Um, and he basically left things behind and trusted his guts opening up a completely new dimension of applied energy work on dog behavior in his own way. Am I fully in agreement? Not 100%. It really doesn't matter. It was his point of view, and I appreciate his point of view because it helped me find my point of view. So even if a trainer or behavior is, is not in line with that I do, right, doesn't mean he's wrong. Doesn't mean he's right. Doesn't mean I'm wrong. Doesn't mean I'm right. It's just different. So imagine Pythagorean and, and whoever philosophers back in time, everybody was saying other things and everybody was like, but you know what? We know what we know now because of those guys. So yeah, if you learn something from me, awesome. Can you recognize that? Let me know. I appreciate that. You learn nothing from me? That's good. At least you avoid what I do so you don't make the same mistake. Either way, it's only for benefit. And you know the bottom line is the dog's benefit. And why are we here? because we want to make a shift in that consciousness of how to handle dogs. And all those pieces come to build a, a mosaic or this uh, a puzzle that helps us better understand why dogs are in our lives. Now, science is very limited how far it can go.
Can I prove my coffee has emotions? Well, coffee doesn't have emotions, but it helps you trigger emotions because of the ingredients. But even though a coffee that is made with love and coffee that is being made with hatred tastes different. Can you explain that to me? No? Have you recognized that your mother's coffee or your mother's meal tastes better? Why is that? Because it happens in your house? No, because there's love in it. And if you don't apply love in your dog training or behavior modification or even with healing without your trauma involved and without your prejudgment involved, then things look much better. So it's important, especially for us who do this kind of work, to keep our shit out of it. If I'm triggered by a client, he needs to know that I'm triggered. So what I usually say, if I'm triggered, I tell them my story. Let me tell you my story, why I get triggered. Let me tell you why it happened. Thank you, Paul. We need to know why you trigger me and why I trigger you. And all of a sudden we come to the common denominator. Man, we have been through the same shit. You and me have been through the same trauma, parenting style, experiences, abuse. Yes, you know what? And that dog is triggering you right now. And you know why we have a client trainer relationship? Because we both have something to learn from it. Either I was there first or you were there first. So each way we have to learn from it. And while trying to explain to me how you felt about things would give you a better understanding why your dog is expressing that behavior so you can be triggered to think about that and then work towards it. And all of a sudden, you recognize that we are in a weird triangle here. Okay? We are here to make a change. I help you ascend and you help me ascend and your dog helps you ascend and all of us ascend together. Why? Because we are playing smart? No. Because we are conscious making decisions how to make things better out of love without including our trauma. Trauma is here to help us go a step further, not to get stuck. And sometimes dogs get stuck with trauma and sometimes they need help getting unstuck. And in order to help them unstuck, we have to recognize that that dog is representing his trauma the same way your core trauma is, right? So why do you think you were attracted to that dog who has been through so much suffering, right? Because he suffered exactly like you. You just have to see it. And once you see it, poof, all of a sudden, that trauma becomes experience. And that trauma is being released. Yes, you have to go through this emotional thing and control it and breathe through it and without stacking it because it was already stuck. We just got rid of it, okay? And then you have to let it go. And then your dog will respond. And suddenly you see, ooh, it's kind of like a whole weight releases. And that dog is like, ooh, see, I told you. If you come in, I'm, I'm angry, you're going to be an asshole. If you be angry to me, I'm going to be angry with you and I'm going to bite your face off. And how did that work out for us so far, right? Because you being angry, I bite your face off. And now you want to get rid of me, I'm going to bite your face again. <laughs> and sometimes we have to just be conscious about that. And says, wait a minute, I have to get my shit together. I cannot just come in with so much intensity from my work. Well, this stupid guy who just crossed my line in my parking lot, how dare his stupid thing. And then I bring that in my house. And that dog just lets you know. Some dogs will come and comfort you. Some dogs will, brrr. some dogs will guard your daughter. Some dogs will guard your husband, your wife. Some dogs will guard you because they don't want you to get more than that if some people got needy. I remember a session I did with a breeder a couple of, um, I think two years ago. So she was breeding dogs specific for service dogs and mastiff breeds and really good genetic line, really good behaved dogs. And she called me and says, hey, I have a problem and I need your help. I have a, a, a dog that I adopted out to a family for a service. And that, that dog shows suddenly aggression. And I'm like, what? How is this happening? So we put archetype cards. And um, 
it was we did, had no information at all on that situation. We only heard the situation from the person who said the dog is aggressive and she wants to return the dog and whatever. Um, and I recognize that this person was using the dog as a defense line towards her seven children or six children, I don't know. So she was breastfeeding one child and that dog starts guarding her from other children because she was bipolar and she has manic depression. She was on pills and she was breastfeeding the child and she just went overfed with all these things. And what she wanted to do is she wants to stop things from happening. And that dog picked up on that and he's like, okay, whatever you tell me to do. And he was guarding her and growling at the kids who wanted their attention. So she isolated herself using the dog as a defense line. Things happen. And if you come in as a behaviorist and you don't pick that information, you're going to lose that dog because that dog is going to hurt someone and he's going to end up in a shelter. And somebody would take that dog and says, oh, this dog has a bite history. Kill him. And it wasn't even his fault. He had no clue. Yeah, I've learned from you that the family knows their dog better than the great trainer. The trainer is there to help translate the dog's and family's behavior and energy towards each other, etc. This leads to understanding and being conscious of each other triggers, human and their dogs. You know what? I'm going to copy that as is, right, into my website. And I so appreciate you. Okay? Feeling emotional right now. So I appreciate you because that's what I do. I want you guys to do that exactly. Come to that conclusion. You don't need us. You don't need a doctor to make you healthy. You get yourself healthy. The dog is only here to help the emergency situation. Help your heart keep poking. Okay? And your kidney is still working. What do you do with it is up to you. Do you want to make it better? You have to do other things than just taking the pills. Right? The doctor would not come to you and hold you responsible things. That's your responsibility. The whole goal is not to need him. Or your goal is not to need me. You need anyone. The more information you have, the better you can judge. Making informed decisions. Getting your dog's consent. Creating a secure attachment relationship. Sure, Kevin. Go ahead. So we have some people from um, YouTube. Welcome. Of course, I've seen some people posting really aggressive questions on YouTube. Um, and it shows exactly their aggressive approach. Um, but I have also amazing questions from people on YouTube. Unfortunately, I can't see them later. But um, I'm looking forward to your question, Kevin. Um, tell, if, if you're a trainer, um, please let me know so I can package accordingly. <laughs> How old am I? Yeah, I passed my 50s. I don't believe it. <laughs> I'm in total denial on that. But yes, I'm beyond my 50s. Um, yeah, that's why my white. You know, after a certain age, you get white. If you see your dog, a senior dog, he has white. He's over 50. <laughs> So, yeah, good. So, guys, um, yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, I hope you have good memories. If you don't have good memories, you're welcome to share them because sometimes it helps talking about it or share with it that we couldn't share with a grandfather. Uh, sometimes we see that... Um, suppressed emotions and not being able to share things with people who passed away or in the past um, are being hold on to. Um, I've seen many times dogs in families represent particular family members. I remember I was dealing with a client in Connecticut, actually. He actually worked with um, Cesar Milan, by the way. And to be more specific, the person I was working with was a friend of his mother's in Mexico who happened to marry somebody. Um, uh, 
the person I was working with was friends with his mother and the daughter was I was working with in that house. But the dogs were the mothers. So long story short, when I did the dynamic evaluation, um, I recognized that there is a dynamic going on in that aspect. And so I was trying to understand which dog was representing, because I recognized there was a representation here. And I was like, this German Shepherd, whose dog is that? We had a Chihuahua who was guarding her. It was sitting under the table like a queen. And if the German Shepherd passed by, that dog would attack that German Shepherd. And I was like, that, that's weird thing going on here. I, I, my guts, my smarter self says, ask the question, ask the question. I was like, why would I ask you a question? It's not my business, ask the question. I was like, whatever, I'm asking the question. Thank you. So I was like, whose dog is that? She says, it's my daughter's. And as soon as she said, it's my daughter's, the dog laid down. And I was like, wow, okay. So where's your daughter? My next question. Well, um, she is whatever she is. Good. Um, so who's taking care of my dog, of her dog now? Her ex-husband. And I was like, wait, what? Your daughter is having her dog who lives with her ex-husband, but your dog is here. Where is the ex-husband? Where he's our personal dog assistant. So this house was a big family, had their own person for the dogs. They had just seven dogs. So her ex-husband was in the home with the mother while the daughter was not at home. And the Chihuahua was attacking that particular dog. Like, don't you see the connection here happening? Long story short, I triggered, I steered a lot of dust up there. Obviously, I didn't keep the job too long because people felt threatened. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? That's what I do. I, I have to say things, things that are reality. They have to be shared. And that's what I said to them. I said, you know what? I will not be able to help you, okay? Because you don't want to deal with it. And that dog needs to deal with it because he doesn't feel home. He feels outcasted. And he needs to work. He, he tries to work himself into the family. And he's basically your daughter's dog being cared by your ex, her ex-husband for whatever. And this dog is being an outcast. And he will resist. So if you don't see that, I will not be able to help you. And of course, a personal assistant came out and wants to check back. <laughs> Take it back. I don't need that check. It's I don't like that. So anyway, long story short, yeah. Um, my dog won't sit still in the car. Can't create his Great Dane. Any tips? Rescued four months ago. Ooh, Julie. Okay. So your dog doesn't feel still in the car because he has trauma and he needs to move in the car. So he's basically pacing his way, his trauma, his fear out of that, in that making movements. Yeah, so basically your problem is not really the car, it's what the car represents. Now the question is, could you imagine how that dog end up in rescue? Do you imagine what goes through your dog's mind when he gets into the car? How many trips have you done to your dog that had a pleasant outcome to your dog to start with okay now since i likely feel you're dealing with a ptsd response that car for your dog means eventually a very very fearful situation we still we have to desensitize the sight of the car we have to desensitize being in the car having to have desensitizing the car moving and predictability where the that car is likely go. So that needs a little bit of, you know, sitting together and making a plan, understanding your situation, understanding your dog situation. I would like to see eventually a video of the individual responses of your dog when you guys go out for a walk or end up in a car. Okay, so which means he is freaking out. Now, where did you guys go the first time with the car? It's my next question. So uh, some I saw something else. Um, did I miss anyone here? Yes, Kevin. 
good, good. You know, you need to leave the, love, love, love dogs. And, um, um, you know, sometimes dogs represent more than people to us. We feel safe with dogs. Okay. So he got very stressed. You know, dogs feel nauseous in the car. You have to see it. I don't know if you guys ever been in a train uh, and you look at the window and suddenly the other train moves and you're like, <sighs> because you thought you're moving, but you're not. Your body responds to the outset movement and it causes you kind of this little nauseousness and dogs get car sick. So I would definitely start with having a vet chat with your veterinarian and um, the veterinarian will be able to prescribe you um, medication for nausea. Um, also, we should look into eventually, um, I don't know how old your dog is, so that will be eventually play an Im important role. Um, sometimes using um, supplements herbal supplements help a lot of situation to regulate the heartbeat rate. And if the dog goes into a survival response, that doesn't trigger other things. So if you go to my website, holisticdogtraining.org, go to the recommendations and you pull down, you're going to see at the very end, I don't want to name it because of the censorship, uh, blah, blah. You know, um, I have a remedies that I really like. Uh, it's at the very bottom. And um, I, I feel this one is energetically very high quality and purity and third party tested. And I use it for my family. My wife use it. I use it. My dogs use it. And I have a very good experience with it. It's, it's a low, um, low productivity. Like it's not like a mass production. It's really a uh, individual package. So check it out. And if you want make a video and send it to me, I want to see the moment you guys put the leash on, or you guys intend to bring the dog to the car, I want to see the whole entire video. You can welcome to message me on that. Um, okay, I think we overkilled it. Um, thank you guys, seven people for so long time. It's really, you guys, your cold coffee. My, my coffee is cold by now. And for you guys who are interested, um, Right after that, I will make you a short walkthrough. <clears throat> How far have I got with our healing center? Right? Our healing center. Our, our, our resource guarding, our healing center, but also inviting our healing center. <clears throat> um, me and my wife uh, bought property a couple of months ago, a few months ago, a couple of weeks ago, with intent to help people. Um, learn how to heal the trauma and that's my wife part and my part is helping people help heal their trauma with their dogs and also some professionals will come and be able to come in and learn what i do at the same time while they're dealing with their dogs and their trauma and everything so it be, it's become a healing sanctuary for people to come in and, and learn things the way we learn things i've been through a process of um, dealing with my own stuff. And I think I have enough learned over the years that I can share with others that will be from benefit. And I think these things will be beneficial to share with others so they can use it. Um, so we're working on it. In the meantime, we also take uh, special, special cases. Uh, and I, I work together with a um, couple of rescues and shelters. And so we can take specific dogs coming in uh, and be worked with and have people from the shelter or from the rescue come and learn from it at the same time as we help the dog, we also help and share information. So these people will bring information back to their base and share that information with their behavior team or other volunteers. So they can learn and be autonomous working with the dogs because you know what? You can feed people, you can water people, but the most important is help them feed and water themselves because that's what we become independent and not being always reliant on people. And those people can help multiple dogs at the same time. I only can help one at a time. So what's the point, me doing things alone? If you are old, the guys can do that yourself, right? So that's my point. So thanks again for watching. Thanks for joining today. Uh, I love your question. We had a very humanish 
and emotional conversation here. Really like it. Um, yep, we totally killed it. One hour and 45 minutes. <laughs> Bye, I need more coffee. <laughs>